It is a huge pleasure to, uh, to welcome Miro back to, to, to Slovak PyCon. When I ask him what, what I should say about him, he's like, don't say anything. So I'm, I guess I'm not going to say anything, but I will say a personal story about Miro. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, well, no, we will not be changing your name. And let's make sure that these uh, microphones are turned on, if, if we can ask the, the BTS group. And, uh, and we, also have, we also have this microphone as a backup, just in case. Uh, and the story I wanted to share is, 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 is very simple. Uh, in the past, Miro has some of the, some of the uh, talks that really, really uh, were really interesting to me. And those were about, about time zones. Uh, you may still remember that Czechoslovakia at the time was the only place in the world, like ever, if I remember correctly, where uh, we not only had uh, summertime uh, and uh, the regular time, but we also had winter time, like three different, di different times, and that is, it was still in the legislation. It was like from 1948 or something. So a lot of super cool facts, so Miro likes to like, dig into little deep, weird things. And uh, that's probably the uh, PyCon video I, I, shared, uh, I shared the most with, with, with my friends. So, so it's, it's always a, a holiday to, to, to see Miro speaking and we are happy to have him back as a speaker. Miro, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So if you leave the room now, not, not now, wait, wait, I will explain first. Um, and go downstairs and take your car and go to the highway to the D, Two, then over the bridge and change to D4 and then continue for about 30 kilometers, you will come to a place with that, that there were plenty of red blinking lights in the evening when it is dark and during the day you will see a lot of uh, wind turbines. And there is even one wind turbine there where you can climb, not completely on the top, but just if you see on the, on the shadow, there is a platform just below the, the engine room uh, where you can climb and uh, see the countryside. You can see up until Schneeberg and uh, the little Carpathi uh, small Carpathian mountains. Uh, and, and that's something, well, go, you go to this website and you can see that, you can visit it. But that uh, wind turbine is not there just uh, as a tourist attraction, it is also producing energy. And the wind turbine, that's a complex machine. You can imagine that's, well, I don't have, didn't take my three blades with me, but imagine that, well, there are the three blades that the uh, wind turbine, for example, knows where the wind comes from because it always wants to face the wind. So for example, if there is a wind coming from there, then it turns slightly there. Then the wind turns, it comes from there, and it always follows the wind. But after three rotations, it had to stop because there are cables that have some liberty, but they are not infinite. So actually, at some moment, the wind turbine says, oh, well, I'm already too much to the right, so now I have to turn back. And then there are thermometers, there are plenty of electrical appliances in that, and all these uh, have to be checked by someone and have to be checked for errors and uh, also to know what is the production of, uh, of the wind turbine. And then comes a data engineer and reads something that looks like a CSV file. So this is a CSV file that comes from such a turbine over one minute, approximately. So as you can see, the first column, that is the timestamp, usually. The second column, can you read it? Or maybe, well, I will zoom a little bit. So the first column is the timestamp. If it is in UTC, then you have one. It depends on the manufacturer. Some manufacturers, they put something there. They even don't know what time zone it is in or uh, what is the format. Uh, the second uh, column is uh, the source, where this comes from. So sometimes there is a one wind turbine that only has that wants to tell you, for example, the entire uh, energy yield. Uh, well, that's simple, that's one number. But uh, sometimes you get, receive this data from a whole wind park and there are several wind turbines and they are numerated and then you have also some parameters from them. So there you have keys that identify the device, so the wind turbine or thermometer, anemometer, so something that uh, measures the wind speed and wind direction. Um, and then the, there comes the value. But take this file and put it into a database. Well, timestamp, that's clear of the type. The second, it's some string text. 
But what is the third uh, column? That could be integer, float, boolean. So usually it will be put into a single uh, float. And then even if there are integers that come in or booleans or strings, then they have to be converted somehow. On the other hand, there are PV plants that are more like, I would say, more like plants. So if I compare a wind turbine to, to, to an animal or a human that uh, has uh, plenty of uh, parameters, a, pl a power plant or a PV power plant is, uh, is a huge tree of, uh, that starts at the very small uh, photovoltaic cells. And if you look on the uh, PV plant from the top, well, that's nice blue or black. But if you look from the bottom, there are plenty of cables. There are small boxes that uh, associate all the current that is at the beginning, it is DC. Then it is changed to AC and uh, transformate it uh, to a different voltage. And there are plenty of sensors. There are thermometers. There are uh, pyranometers. Pyranometer is something that measures the irradiation. And that counts the sheep. Uh, that's very important. You can have sheep uh, if you have a PV plant. Never take goats. They are, they are destroying the plant when they jump on it. Sheep, they are fine. They are going to eat the grass around it, and that's fine. So uh, this PV plant that collects all this information and that sends it again to those who want not only to know how much it is, uh, energy it is producing, but also if there are any problems. Because if you are going to cover halfway a panel, and on the other half there is a shine, uh, sun shining, then you are going to burn it because the difference in voltages is going to be very important. And the CSV file that comes from such a plant can look like this. I know I will zoom right now. So this is something that you receive, for example, every 30 minutes. And you have from this huge tree, from this PV plant that contains several tra transformation, transformators, uh, plenty of inverters, uh, some devices that uh, measure the voltage, uh, amperes and whatever. Uh, they are all identified here, and then you receive a CSV file that has 500, 5,000. I have seen CSV files with 20,000 columns. And the same way, they are identified by the tree uh, position within the tree, and then the parameters. If you store this in the database, this is better because, well, every column can be of a uh, specific uh, type. But on the other hand, you don't want to write a select for, for 10,000 columns. But you probably didn't come for the PV and wind. You came for the title. And there are two hard problems in computer science. The first one is cache invalidation. I tried to find something within uh, the data that uh, I'm working with and uh, found actually that, well, what you are using, or the data that you have, is it a three-dimensional three field that's time stamp, device, and parameter. And there are devices that always give you the re most recent information on uh, some parameters, uh, but uh, there are some that, well, something doesn't work, but they still have to, to deliver you a big CSV file. And now, how, what is it going to do? Is it going to, uh, if there is a value missing, and 15 minutes later, or 10 seconds later, a new uh, entry has to arrive, what value is it going to write? You, you have to know it. You have to know what your sensor is. Is your sensor going to give you empty value or is it going to give you uh, nothing? But it cannot give you nothing in CSV. You have to give you null. But null can mean I don't have the data now or I don't have the data in general. Or is it going just uh, to repeat the last value that is known? Um, so if we take uh, such a CSV file that, that was this narrow, long uh, file, then what can happen here is that if you don't have an information, you just don't get the entry. And the, then your three-dimensional space is just going to have tiny holes. And that's fine, but you have to know to cache somehow the previous information and decide whether you want to take it or uh, whether you just uh, say that, well, there is uh, nothing. If you have this white file, um, then you see that uh, well, you have always to give some information. It can be now, it can be the previous information or the uh, new, new one. Um, now, in this example, I took two anemometers, so two devices that uh, measure wind, and, uh, wind speed and wind direction, and a uh, thermometer that measures the temperature. And you see that in both cases, it is somehow, well, in the second case, imagine that I get the third anemometer, then I need two new columns, NMO3 wind speed, NMO3 wind direction. Well, you are going to change the structure of your database the whole time. What could be the good compromise between these two? And my suggestion is, well, look at the individual devices. 
divide your tables by devices. And this is it. So you can create a table for every device type, and there is a type anemometer that usually gives you always wind speed and wind direction, thermometer gives you always temperature, and you have two tables, and logically you know I want to do something with wind uh, speed and wind direction, I take this type table, or I take that table. And then, uh, since the timestamp and device are the primary key, uh, primary keys together, uh, then you can add any number of new devices, and if you remove a device, then it will just stop uh, giving you the information and you will have a little bit less data, but you will not have holes and you don't have to change the structure. So that was the first uh, hard problem, cache uh, invalidation, and now naming things. So we have already three parameters, wind speed, wind tear, direction probably, and temp temperature, or temporary, no, it's temperature. But uh, some other file gives me ambient temperature in degrees Celsius. Then I have a temperature of the main oil tank uh, in Celsius, and supplementary oil tank temperature, and uh, rotor speed, and uh, uh, average wind speed, and velocity and media deviant and meters per secundo. And imagine that even you can write something in Slovak with, uh, uh, with MacChain and uh, Wokan, even Wokan, Wokan, that's ugly, uh, if it appears somewhere in a CSV file, because many people think that it is only a typo, but it's a beautiful letter. Um, so now we are going to finally don't not only look at the data structures, we are going to use something that we are all here for. What are we here for? Six letters. P, Y, T, H, Python. Python, and another thing that will help me will be pandas. I don't have an image of Python eating pandas. <laughs> uh, 10 minutes after this picture I've taken uh, in a terrarium, uh, they gave it a uh, Piggle, piglet, so a small pig, but it, will, it didn't look like pandas and I won't share the picture of it with you. There are three basic things that I would recommend you uh, to use with uh, the names of your parameters. The string, it is is identifier, is ASCII, is lower, which means that you will thank me if you can name your parameters the way that you can use it as Python variables as columns in databases in PostgreSQL, MySQL, in Databricks that you can use as uh, columns in pandas, that, that you can just use as file names. So no minuses, no wokines, uh, no, no uh, spaces, uh, no brackets. If you work at a company that respects or follows some standards, congratulations. I have seen many standards that are backed up, paid by big companies that even these companies don't support them entirely. So if you can use these standards perfectly well, but if not, then have a look at all your parameters that you are using in your domain and uh, try to find a system. So I, this uh, is lower, is ASCII, is identifier, is lower, is everything lower, no uppercase, is ASCII means, well, no, uh, nothing beyond ASCII, and is identifier is something that can be used as a Python uh, variable name. So it doesn't start with a number, with a digit, there are no minuses, uh, no spaces, and so on. So now I have taken all these uh, um, parameter names and I have converted them to lowercase with underscores. It still looks messy to me. Does it look messy to you? Well, maybe some of you are happy with that, but imagine that I told, I told you about 10,000 columns. So you have plenty of parameters. How can I optimize this? I can optimize this. I am going to use one very useful tool that is called GraphVis. GraphVis, that's free tool in, in standard operating system, so we installed it as a package, uh, and uh, then what you do is you write a file that is dot file, so dot 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 file, and you write the, uh, the relations between the objects. And now you see that I'm using something that looks like variables, so I can use temperature of the main all tank and these individual words. And you write a digraph with uh, small arrows and uh, uh, semicolon at the end, and then run this uh, graphics, and it will give you a picture that will look exactly like this. I didn't modify anything. It gives you exactly this. I can absolutely recommend you to use graphics if you need some organization. So, for example, you know you have uh, plenty of entities, you have plenty of steps in your project, and you use, uh, let's say, some project uh, software that starts with a J uh, that doesn't support this uh, natively. Um, then just export all the steps and write all the relations at the beginning or, 
or in, in this file and then run it. And then you will see, oh, there are things that are not connected with each other. We have arrows that go back. So there are plenty of uh, possibilities visually that you can, uh, that will help you to optimize the stuff. And here I see that I have really very long chains of individual words of the parts of the variable name. And uh, I have uh, also some arrows that go backwards. So this looks uh, quite messy. And what I do here, I will try to optimize it. I will not show you the steps in between, but this is my result. So for example, I replaced all units with something that is single. So if there were kilometers per hour, I converted them to meters per second. And what I did was at the last, is the last word within this uh, long variable name, it is always the variable, not the variable, sorry, the unit. Before that is the main word, is the substantive, so the known, what it is about. So temperature, wind di direction, wind speed, and so on. And before that are the specifiers. And for example, you see that there is oil tank as one word. You can, you should write oil underscore tank and then have two words. But that would make sense only if you had oil tank and water tank. So you could have a beautiful tree that has as many, oh sorry, as few connections between uh, the words as possible and your tree should be uh, compact. And this is something that you can extend later with uh, other variables that will uh, help you to organize uh, your variable names uh, in, a, in a good and efficient way. And that will be the knowledge base actually for your company, for your business. So we have touched uh, now naming things. So there were two hard problems. It is cache invalidations, naming things, and off by one errors. Let's have a look at this CSV file. So this is some measurement. Don't look at the third column. There can be any parameter. Uh, but this is, these are some value. This, this is actually a real part of data that I have seen already. And with the little Spanish that I understand, I was able to decipher actually the second column that was very important, uh, INV. Uh, it means invierno, verano, and it's a winter or summer. So actually, they use, uh, they de define uh, the time in local time, and they add uh, I or V in the second column that defines whether it is uh, standard uh, time or daylight saving time. Um, now, if we want to aggregate this by day, well, you have the column date, the first, or the timestamp, and then you could just extract date and then group it. But look at the column, at the column that has value four, that has value five, the, the one that has value five, so that's set to midnight. Uh, is that, that is an, uh, the production within 15 minutes before or after this 15 minutes, or before midnight? Yeah? So this means that if there is zero, zero, it means actually the 15 minutes that are there before. So we are calling this right bound. So we will have buckets, and the timestamp that is there, it identifies the end of the timestamp, or of the, of the 15 minutes interval, which means that I want to take this entry of the 16th March, 0000. zero, zero, zero. I want to put it to the day before. So I cannot simply take date, cut it, and then group by it, because the 15 minutes will come to the other uh, day, to the wrong day. Uh, this is usually not a problem with uh, uh, PV plants, because in Europe, well, if you don't do ugly stuff, then you don't have sun at night, you don't have lights on your PV plants. Uh, but wind, uh, of course, uh, there is wind uh, almost the whole time, so you, have, you can have the problems. Um, so this means that you have to distinguish between entries that are timestamps that are triggered by the time and that are looking at some sum. Some or, well, some, it is a sum over an interval of, uh, of time. Uh, best uh, it can be explained here. So I have two graphs here, two values. I have some average temperature and I have uh, precipitation per month. It is important to see that, to distinguish which graph you want to take. You want to take a line la graph. Line graph is good for stuff that is status, that is temperature, wind speed, such stuff. That if you are missing one value, then very probably it will be the average between the value before then and before after that, because you nev can never go to zero. And the black uh, bars uh, is the quantity. So I have the quantity of uh, five uh, millimeters uh, in January, or six, uh, which means that 
if I'm missing this value, I cannot interpolate or look at what or what are the values before that or after that. And also, I cannot do something like a sum of the yearly temperature. It doesn't make sense, but you can make something like the sum of the yearly uh, precipitation. And in pandas, you have the timestamps, you have daytime index that allows you to work with stuff with that is really based on time, exactly the, the time in, in microseconds. But it would be nice to have something that allows you to work with intervals, with periods. So I would like to have the entry, this entry is valid for these, one day for this, one year. Unfortunately, there is something like that. There is period. And you can do really beautiful math with that. So if you write, some, for example, PD period now D, that it creates a period object that represents the day, today, exactly the, the whole day. And uh, if you need to use these uh, objects uh, to work with database or to show this somewhere and you need exactly the beginning at the end, then you have the attributes, uh, start time and time that give you exactly the uh, timestamps that uh, are at the beginning and at the end. Uh, you can do maths like this, so if you have the period of the current day, you can do minus one and you get, you receive the previous period, so yesterday, plus 300, whatever, so you can jump around. And uh, there are periods for day, there are periods also for other, other time intervals, uh, so there is for year, and what you see in the second line, it re uh, returns a period of 2024 year minus that December which means that this works with the standard, with the default that the year ends in December. But if your financial year ends in March, for example, then you write Y minus Mar, and it will define a year that starts in, Mar in April and ends it uh, in March. And the same is for quartals. So if you have quartals that are not exactly the three uh, the blocks of uh, three months from January, then you can define that uh, months, uh, week. Week, this is important. The default is uh, W uh, sun for our weeks that end on Sunday, if you start your week on Saturday, or Sunday, then you want to write there W sat. Um, then you have uh, days that we have seen, uh, hours, uh, minutes, seconds, microseconds. And everywhere you can do the math. So you have, you define a period of that hour, plus, minus, and it will count uh, correctly. Um, now, imagine that you would like to have some intervals that are not exactly hours, minutes, seconds, days, but you would like to have something like six hour blocks. So the first quarter of day, the second quarter of day. If I do this, then I receive the current hour. That was uh, nine o'clock now. Uh, but if I do six hours, I can do that. I will get a period that is six hours long, but that starts now at nine o'clock. I would like to start it, well, now we are before lunch and uh, we want to have a six hour clock that started at six in the morning. And uh, for that, the, the shortest uh, thing that I found was this. So we have to define the timestamp, floor it to six hours, and then change it to period of six hours, you will receive it correctly. I suggested actually to, uh, to Panda's uh, project uh, in an issue to have it uh, shorter and somewhere directly in the PD period uh, constructor, but uh, since several months there was uh, no reply. And with this, you can do beautiful stuff. You can create even period range. So for example, with this, you tell, I want the period of the previous three days until yesterday. You create a period range. So with the end is uh, the day of yesterday and the number of periods is three. Or you can have also the year to day. So the list of all days uh, from the beginning of the year, from uh, the 1st of January until now. And uh, what is great about this is what I use it for is if I have uh, functions that, uh, ver that, for example, read something from the database and uh, I could give the parameters arguments where I say this is the first day and the last day and I was this frequency, it is easier to create once a, a period index in the main program and then pass it around to everyone because I expect from every function that it returns a data frame that I can further process and I can test every function that if I give it a period index, it returns me a data uh, object, uh, sorry, a data frame object that has the same index. And the tests, who is testing? Who is writing tests here? Seven, nice. That's a good start. <laughs> so you can, uh, you can use this actually to have nice status quo, this is what I am working on, and all the functions, everyone is going to use this uh, uh, period index, uh, and when I receive it, then I can test it. 
So this was it. Keep your data frames in good shapes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miro. Um, well, you were talking about the picture of, of, uh, of, of a python eating a panda. So I went back to, to, to Dali to, to generate an image. And again, inappropriate content. So <laughs> it's really hard to get some, some visual imagery sometimes. Um, just a reminder for, uh, for all of you, the, we are using Slido. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can ask that QR code or go to slido.com and enter icon SK. Uh, so that you can ask your questions that way, or we can pass a mic around. Before we start with a the, with the Q&A, if you could please just, uh, those who are sitting on, on the sides, if you could please sit uh, closer to the center because we have folks sitting uh, on, on the stairs, so please um, make room for them. Question number one, uh, about naming things. What are your favorite lessons learned or mental hacks for naming variables in Python? Um, there is Zen of Python, so import this. Uh, where it says explicit is better than implicit. So when I was younger, I preferred to have short variable names. Now I tend more to more explicit because if there is something like TMP, and well, then we are discussing with the colleagues what is temporary or temperature or, well, we don't know. So that's why we tried to set a good set of to set a good set of uh, uh, basic variable names uh, and uh, use them everywhere, and then the life is easier. Well, do you remember any time you went like overboard? Okay, this is too much. Maybe I went too too explicit with a variable name. Do you remember any any like really crazy variable name? Uh, recently, we uh, changed uh, black uh, from 80 to 120 characters. So now we have much more room for nice variable <laughs> names. That's a, that's a really good hack. I like that a lot. Any questions from the audience? OK, Miro will be, OK, there's, there's one. Let me just run with, uh, with the mic so everybody can hear you well. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you're using functions that uh, both take uh, pandas the data frames as arguments and return them. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. They take uh, the period index only. Okay, okay. Uh, but I was wondering, um, do you use any kind of format checks on those pandas data frames, or how do you make sure that um, the format is satisfied uh, without getting messy about you know the input data and output data? Well, the, in, in the test, of course, I assert or I test that, uh, that the function returns the shape exactly that I need. So. That should be usually enough. But uh, what, what's great about periods is that if you have two data frames that have both period index that is different, it is like with data frames. It doesn't allow you to, to join whatever is of different index. So that's, that's also a good check. That at the, at the result where, where you have plenty of functions that give you some data and then you aggregate it somehow, then you will receive an error if uh, some function returned uh, a period index that was in a different frequency or different format. There's another question. What is your favorite case? So how do, how do you like to uh, case your variable names? Yes. <laughs> Snake, okay, that was a quick one. Any other questions from the audience? All right, so uh, let's go back to what we, what we talked about before. Let's use these, this opportunity uh, to, to meet each other. And our next talk will be starting at 10.15. But before we go, let's give a big round of applause to Miro. Thank you.